I want to welcome you to a special episode of Pod for Israel, and I have with me Dr. David Mishkin. And we're going to be talking about the history of the Messianic Church, you could say, of really of the Jewish believers in Jesus, because saying Messianic Church is a bit of a loaded uh, yeah. <laughs> loaded statement in, in itself. Even Messianic is a little bit of a loaded statement. Uh, but, but basically, what happened to the Jewish followers of Jesus over the years up till today, from zero... AD to today. Well, let's go from uh, from ground zero. Uh, some people think as soon as Jesus showed up, well, that was it. Now there's Christianity. Yeah. Actually, the word Christianity does not appear in the New Testament. The mm -hmm. word Christian does three times, but it refers to a follower of the Messiah sent by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, it uh, wasn't the followers of Zeus who were waiting for a Messiah. It was a very Jewish concept. Little Messiahs, you know, is yeah. a, kind of the interpretation of it, you know, little Mashiachs. Yeah, and it was actually what a lot of scholars would call the parting of the ways, which would take about 300 years for both Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, and Christianity to develop. So what happened? Well, there was a Jewish guy named Jesus uh, who had a group of Jewish followers, and he lived in a Jewish place, and he claimed to be the fulfillment of the Jewish writings, and he spoke in a Jewish way. Uh, after that, we saw his Jewish followers bring this message to the world. And in the book of Acts, we have the history of perhaps the first three decades. And it doesn't take that long to go outside the bounds, when you're going around the world, to go outside the bounds of the Jewish world. The plan right. from Acts 1-8 was to start in Jerusalem and then go to Judea and Samaria and then, you know, the rest of the world. So pretty soon, the movement spread pretty quickly, pretty soon they were in non-Jewish lands. So it wasn't that long before the Gentile followers of Jesus would start to outnumber the hmm. Jewish believers in Jesus, the one who really got the whole ball rolling. And we see the context was changed. So yeah. now when they read, let's say, the Gospels, when there was a debate between Jesus and the Jewish leaders, they didn't read it as an in-house debate. In other words, in the Old Testament, for example, Isaiah or Jeremiah had very harsh words against the Jewish leaders of their day. Why? Because they were anti-Semitic? No, it was an in-house debate, right. you know, a Jewish person uh, uh, condemning their own people. So in, uh, after the earliest years of uh, the Gospel going forth, this Jewish background and the Jewish roots were lost. So this is the first thing that happened. They didn't realize that it was, you know, an us against them issue, which it later became. Yeah. And, you know, you think about it, there was some key things that started the whole downfall. But, you know, part of it, you see Paul prophesied that this would happen. You know, you read in, in one of his epistles, he's saying he knew it's like God gave him a vision of what would happen after he passed and the downfall, you could say, of that early church and how, you know, and we read in history, it got political, power started, and, and that's pretty much any of these moves of God, you know, goes really sour and really nasty fast when politics and power and ego start to, and insecurity creeps in, right? Well, absolutely. And we see in the first century, we don't really talk about Second Temple Judaism. We put an S at the end, Second Temple Judaisms, mm -hmm. and obviously Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes and right. everybody else. But after the destruction of the Second Temple, there were basically two groups that lasted. Uh, the group that would go on to, in a sense, create rabbinic Judaism is founded on the principles of Pharisaic Judaism, and the other Judaisms kind of followed suit. For example, what happened to the Sadducees? Well, for the most part, they were the priests. So yeah. if you're a priest and the temple is destroyed, you're out of work. Yeah. Uh, so this new thing developed. So that's one group that existed in the first century that continued. The other group was the followers of Jesus. That was a Jewish movement that began in the late Second Temple period. And the difference was that this Jewish movement went out and also included Gentiles. So as I said, pretty soon, the Gentiles are going to start outnumbering uh, the Jewish believers in Jesus. And what happened was it was basically a rivalry. And the question was, which of these two groups now is the true heir to right. the Old Testament. And you think about it, so there's jealousy, there was envy and strife, and and it started off that 
the Jews were jealous. If we read through Acts, the Jews were jealous at uh, Paul, the popularity that Paul had when he would preach the gospel. And so many of the Gentiles, the whole city was coming to, to Yeshua. And then they were jealous, like, hey, well, you never had this. And they stirred up dissent. Well, then later you start to see as that population flipped, now there's majority Gentiles. There was a jealousy back now towards the Jews, right? Yeah. And again, this rivalry as two groups are solidifying what would become Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, and Christianity. What about the Jewish believers in Jesus? You know, as boundaries and walls were being set up in each case, Mm -hmm. uh, the Jewish believers don't quite fit. And there was a lot of animosity and hostility. So it was slowly becoming an issue where one or the other, you got to choose. And some of these issues of of rebellion and rivalry were were the real issues, even more than theology. We talked about the uh, kind of how things went dark for a period of time, right? You know, it seemed like the community was snuffed out, but was it snuffed out? Well, it depends what you mean by community. Basically, when Jewish Jewish followers of Jesus. When scholars talk about... Uh, the parting of the ways, you know, well, when did that kind of end or become complete? Well, probably Constantine in the early fourth century. He was the one who made Christianity at first, before it became the official religion of the Roman Empire, it was right. allowable. And that was a big change. Mm-hmm. He also instituted other rules. He said, it's forbidden, it's illegal for Jews and Christians to marry. He mm-hmm. said, if you're part of the now the Christian church, uh, no more circumcision, don't celebrate Passover, mm. don't celebrate the Sabbath. So that was really yeah. when clear lines were, were delineated. Yeah, and so you see there was kind of, I, I always look at that phase as a bit of the sin of Jeroboam. And we know the biblical story of Jeroboam, the, the northern tribes split from the southern tribes of Judah, and there was animosity, there was insecurity, and there was a political power grab going on at the time. And so I see a lot of similarities between that same sort of kind of, you could say, the root sin, which, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, it says the sin of Jeroboam continued in the sin of Jeroboam to uh, quite a few kings. It was almost like a type of iniquity. Uh, and we see some of the same patterns in that early church. There yeah, and, and to go back to your other question, what, what was the progression? How did it happen? The formal church went from being completely Jewish, but eventually less Jewish and then non-Jewish and pretty quickly anti-Jewish with this rivalry. And we see, for example, even in the early Middle Ages, the lines were drawn. So if there was a Jewish person who wanted to believe in Jesus and become part of the church, they had to get baptized, not only to recognize Jesus Mm. as the Messiah, they had to renounce their Jewishness. And what unfortunately happened, which is even more horrible, some of, during the Middle Ages, some of these new Jewish converts, as they would have been called, were the most hostile to Jewish people Mm. because that was the framework of the church. So that was, you know, the Middle Ages is about a thousand years. And uh, then after the Protestant Reformation, I believe that was a step in the right direction, not without its problems, obviously. We could (laughs) do a whole show on that. But really in the last few hundred years, this slow movement once again, just to the reality of Jewish believers in Jesus, we're seeing really an explosion in our lifetime. So we think about the Dark Ages, we think about this, there wasn't, the Jewish followers of Jesus were never snuffed out. The communities still remained. Uh, they were they were definitely put to the peripheral, but at the same time, uh, God did preserve a remnant during that time. But you know, I think it's really key. Like we look through history, not just to look through history and wag our heads, but what what broke down, what got nasty to make things go so south, so bad. And part of it, I see, like we talked about the sin of Jeroboam, insecurity, pride, um, fear, things like that, uh, power, political power grabs, that, that kills the faith today. Think about, you know, some of the heresies and bad movements that happen because of that. But then secondly, along with all those insecurities, there was also kind of a dark age for the word of God, because what happened in the middle of that Constantine's revolution, it went from, think about life in the synagogue, you know, Yeshua, you know, came in and read from Isaiah and it was common that they knew that in a synagogue service, they would open the Torah scroll and the word of God would be read to the common people for them to hear. So the word of God was democratized. But then if we look at kind of that, you know, 
dark, the beginning of the dark ages, did they have the word of God for the common people to read? Well, a short answer is no. Uh, through most of the middle ages, even the clergy often <laughs> hadn't read the scriptures. Right. And there was a lot of tradition, bad tradition. That's why the Protestant Reformation, mm. if nothing else, the idea of sola scriptura, let's go back to the word of God, right. that was a good thing. But the rivalry that was developing over the first two or 300 years after Jesus, uh, as I said, lines were being drawn and the side which was becoming Christianity was saying, right. well, look at you guys, you, you, you don't have a temple anymore. You're mm. no longer in the land. You're obviously cursed. God is yeah, obviously finished with you. With you. Right. And because of that, they read scripture through that lens instead of looking at reality through cherry scripture. Cherry-picked scripture. Yeah. Obviously, we know how da dangerous yeah. cherry-picking little verses can and be. And I, I think, you know, this is really the cause of, of what's usually called replacement theology. Mm -hmm. It started with a rivalry and a historical reality yeah. rather than looking into God's word. Uh, you know, after the Protestant Reformation, over the next couple of hundred years, there were streams of Christians, yeah. as they're looking into the scriptures, you know what? Uh, first of all, there, there's a lot about the Jews in the yeah, Old Testament. Right. And you know what? In the New Testament, there's a lot about the Jews. That's right. And some streams of Christianity, you know, it seems like there's a there's good news. There's a future for this people. Right. Unfortunately, not every stream of Christianity believes that, but it took uh, a process of going back to Scripture. And this is kind of the roots of the last few hundred years of the rise of the reality of Messianic Jews. So we talked about the Dark Ages now in the Protestant Reformation. But again, you know, when you get to the Protestant Reformation, you see that's when you started having these bold men and women of God that started uh, copying out the scriptures, translating into the modern vernacular, getting it back into the hands of the common people again. And then you started to have real reforms start to break out. And it also kind of changed these cultural ideas, anti-Semitic ideas about the Jewish people as well. They started seeing God's purpose and plan for his people and that the covenant wasn't annulled in the New Testament, right? Yeah. Uh, not only going back to the scriptures, which is always a good idea, right. but the idea of faith alone. In other words, there was a time prior to that where an infant was in a sense being baptized both a Christian and a citizen of the Roman Empire, mm. several hundred years before yeah. that. And now the Protestant Reformation is saying, no, each person uh, needs their own faith. And this would lead to people saying, you know what? I'm an Italian follower of Jesus. I live in this country. I live in that country. Uh, those are two different issues. And that would pave the way for this incredibly radical idea that even a mm. Jewish person can say, I'm a believer in Jesus too. So, you know, we talked about the Middle Ages. Now we're into the Reformation. What's some key things that happened during uh, this time of the Reformation uh, with the Jewish people? Well, along with uh, going back to the scriptures, uh, which was good for everybody, one thing was a little bit of the pressure was off the Jewish people because during most of the Middle Ages, it was like the whole world. The church was against the Jews. Now it was Catholics against Protestants. Mm. And pretty soon it was all the different Protestant groups. So that was like a pressure valve. Right. It wasn't everybody against the Jewish people. Uh, but as we enter the modern world, we also see the beginning of liberalism, both in Christianity and in Judaism. And what started to happen in the Enlightenment period in Europe and, and a lot of it in England specifically, uh, now Jewish people are able to go to the university. For a long time, they were in ghettos, they weren't allowed to, and they started hearing about things the rabbis probably didn't want them to talk about. Mm. And because the church was very liberal, a lot of higher criticism, it was kind of okay for Jewish people to study that as well. In other words, uh, if there was a group of uh, monks or priests who took the word of God seriously, the Jewish people probably wouldn't be invited and wouldn't want to go. But now we see it was almost a secular study. So even though in the early 19th century, there were more and more uh, Jewish people going to the universities, they were able to study even the New Testament, uh, although through kind of a liberal lens. Also mm -hmm. in the 19th century, we have what are called Hebrew Christians, mm -hmm. and they would be uh, renamed, in a sense, in the early 20th century, Jewish Christians, and a little bit after that, we would get Messianic Jews. So the Hebrew Christians 
uh, in England was really an amazing movement. There was right. Alfred Edersheim, who wrote uh, one of the books, which is still considered one of the best Life of Christ books mm. in the English language. It's called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And people like David Barron, who wrote about prophecy. Mm. And there was really a whole cluster uh, you know, some of them were missionaries like Solomon Alexander, who was the first, uh, um, he was Anglican, but he was actually the first Protestant bishop in the Middle East. So we hmm. see not only scholarship, but we see going out through the rest of the world. There was uh, a man named Joseph Sereshewski. It's a fun name to say. He hmm. was a scholar of Semitic languages. He went to China he translated quite a bit <laughs> of, of the scriptures into, into Mandarin, you know, wow. so it was, uh, some of them were Orthodox and, you know, they knew the scriptures and prophecy, but we also see Jewish believers uh, going around the world uh, doing, in a sense, what Paul was talking about in Romans 11, what is the original job mm. description of the Jewish people. Right. You know, when Paul said, yeah, it's not a good thing that most Jewish people rejected the gospel, uh, but that was good because God allowed the Gentiles mm. to hear it. But then Paul right. says, still in Romans 11, that what's it going to be like when, in a sense, the messengers grab a hold of the message? Mm. That's a yeah. paraphrase there. It's going to be like life from the dead. So sure. it was in the 19th century, based on some of the progress of the Protestant Reformation, which is really the beginning of the modern movement and explosion of Messianic Jews. Right. So we see this just real, there was awakening actually yeah. in Europe, really up to all the way to the Holocaust. There was a, a, a great like growth of, you could say, this messianic movement, messianic scholarship and, and great minds. And when we think about kind of what led up to the Holocaust, of course, it's a horribly dark period, but there was this revival ahead of that time most people are unaware of. And, you know, we think about all the people that we lost, and we also lost many Messianic scholars inside the fires of the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, all over Europe, there were Messianic, uh, maybe not the name Messianic, but Messianic right. centers. They were preaching in Yiddish. That was mm. the common Jewish language. And it is an untold story. We'll get into that a little bit at the course where it was it was quite big, perhaps even bigger in number than, than even though today we have media. <laughs> we yeah, have this, so yeah. we could roar very loudly, but it was quite big. So the exact numbers of uh, how many Jewish believers were there during the Holocaust, hmm. people have tried to get different figures. It certainly is a lot more than we would have thought. Right. And especially uh, there are stories, there was a man named Rachmiel Friedland, who was yeah. in the Holocaust, and he was a Talmudic scholar, and he became a believer, and his book is called When Being Jewish Was a Crime. Hmm. And he talks about not only himself, but others sharing the gospel, even in the camps. Wow. So we don't want to speculate too much, but there are many Jewish yeah. believers in Jesus at the time. I, you know, I was at a lecture, it blew my mind uh, many, you know, years ago, about 10 years ago, and in the lecture, they were talking, they were quoting, actually, a secular historian, uh, in the Holocaust, she went through the Holocaust, and she was saying that there were in the Warsaw Ghetto there were many Messianic Jews, like many Jewish followers of Jesus, in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, and and she said most of them were intellectuals. These these were thinking people. These were yeah. not just you know like you know duped by these uh, missionaries, as yeah, someone would yeah. say. Uh, they were the intellectuals. They were all brilliant people, and uh, and there was many coming to faith inside the ghetto, knowing, you know, just like the other guy you mentioned, he had no illusions that he would get any mercy from the Nazis mm -hmm. just because he believes in, in Jesus. Uh, his faith gave him no quarter. And uh, for these people who are coming to faith, they knew that they were headed to the same fate. Yeah. But there was this awakening happening there, and it, oh, it gripped my heart. I never heard that story before. Yeah, people sometimes say, oh, well, some of the people who became Christians, they were just trying to avoid a right. certain fate. Uh, and that, as you just said, that, that wasn't the case, you know. Yeah. And, and Hitler's rule was if you had one Jewish grandparent, uh, you're Jewish, you know, and that was the end of the discussion. Yeah. So we could see in the Holocaust, uh, people, uh, a witness went out, people heard. That mm. we could say for sure. It's such a beautiful history that, hardly anyone knows. 
Yeah. And we're working on a, a big project with this too, a documentary. But, you know, the exciting thing is, uh, and obviously you've rattled through so many stories that I know you have a long story that you made just very short. Uh, the exciting thing is we actually have a Zoom course coming up with uh, Dr. David Mishkin, and he's going to be teaching through uh, in the Zoom course on Wednesdays, right? Starting October 18th? Uh, October 11th. Oh, sorry, October 11th on Wednesdays, uh, live uh, on Zoom. So it's if you live guys in join. Israel. So depending on where you live, you have to figure out <laughs> what time it is where you are. Yeah, it might be crack of dawn or late at night, depending yeah. on if Australia or US. But uh, yeah, so we'll be having our Zoom courses. You can ask uh, Dr. Mishkin, you know, what questions you would have inside the Zoom course. That's the, that's kind of the great benefit right there is, uh, you know, they can interact with you and, and ask extra questions in the course. But you'll be able to go into a lot more detail. This in, you know, about the history, what went wrong, uh, you know, what what happened, some of the some of the good and the bad. Um, so we're really excited about offering that course coming up. Again, October 11th is when it starts. October 11th. So yeah. you guys sign up. We'll have a link in the just in the description below. Uh, but also, just I think you know, just to kind of close this thought, as we look back at history, I think it's important. You know, maybe some of you guys are like, well, I'm a gentile. This is kind of interesting. But what does this mean to me? Uh, I would say number one. Part of the miracle of Israel today is that God has preserved this nation and this people and this language and everything. And the preservation is uh, absolutely a miracle that we see in our day. No other society would come back to their nation like what God has done here. But also there's a preservation of the saints through the ages. Mm -hmm. And God promised that. And uh, he did say the way was narrow and few yeah. find it. Yeah. But he also promised a way. But then also... I. I I think when we look at church history and Jewish history, it really comes again into my heart. I remember when, uh, when I was first called to Israel that, you know, uh, those who sow in tears bearing precious seed will surely return rejoicing, mm -hmm. bearing their sheaves with them. And I don't think you can go through this history without sowing some tears. Yeah. And uh, yeah. there's definitely on our part a great, you know, mourning for what, our forefathers. We don't want to be uh, distancing ourselves from you know what happened in the past. Uh, I would I wouldn't have partaken with that uh, if I would have been there. Um, but also just uh, an intercession, you know, yeah. for healing, obviously over the past. But also there's a rejoicing for wow. There's so many stories. You mentioned just a few of these amazing saints, these amazing men and women of God, who boldly shared the gospel. Who mm. Uh, knowing they they would lose everything. Many of these rabbis who came to faith that you talk about, they lost all their authority. They lost all their friends, family. A community was gone for them. So it was a big step. It's really the story of God's faithfulness. You know, we're recording this in Israel, and some people, I, I don't know how this is possible, some people, even believers, don't uh, agree that what's happening here is is of God, mm. Jewish people coming back to the land. I really can't see how anyone would say that, but we need to take a step back before that because it's the survival of the people for about 2,000 years before yeah. the great influx. And God promised in Jeremiah 31, uh, after he speaks about uh, the new covenant, he says, you know, uh, unless the fixed order is changed, He's basically talking about the what we would call the laws of physics. But he yeah. said, unless the sun stops shining, hmm. you guys, God is speaking to Israel, you guys are always going to be here. So yeah. even before we get to the return to Israel, we've got to look at the amazing act of God in survival for the last 2,000 years. It's a beautiful love story. Well, Father, we thank you for that love story. We thank you for that story of your faithfulness written uh, in flesh and blood through your people of how you have been faithful uh, through insurmountable odds and done amazing things. And Lord, we thank you for this course. We thank you for Dr. Mishkin. And Father, we just ask that you would, um, Lord, that you would bring great awakening and revival in our day uh, amongst the Jewish people and amongst the nations as well. And uh, that this course would be a great blessing to the people. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. If this touched your heart, will you help pay it forward to reach others who need to hear this message? Partner with our team to bring the gospel to Israel and the nations.